So framing the conflict in, uh, of the issue of what's going on there in the right way is a necessary step towards the future. Now, most people who are activists and definitely people who live uh, under occupation and colonization would feel that this, they don't have the patience or the time for such a process to mature. Understandably, they would like to see immediate results, an immediate end to their suffering. And they would say, it would take too long for you to convince people to use the right language, to frame correctly uh, what was uh, misframed, if you want, in the last 30, if not the last 70 years. But unfortunately, sometimes there are no shortcuts in history. Sometimes you have to do the long, to take the long journey, even if you wasted 40, 50 years of not going in the right direction. And I'm not saying again that this is the only missing uh, element. I mentioned again, and I will mention it again, the American policy, Palestinian unity, and maybe other elements that some of you would probably bring up in the Q&A session. But all of it will not work if we will not begin to use the right language when we speak about the past in Palestine and when we speak about the present and the future. So one important uh, element in the new language is, of course, the word colonialism. And one can see how the Israelis successfully convince people that this is an anachronism. Who can talk in 2015 about colonialism? This is something associated in the minds of people with 19th century uh, British imperial policies, French policies, and maybe even more ancient policies of the Spain, uh, Spain and, and Portugal, Holland and Belgium, and so on. But the reality is that, uh, uh, and thanks to very uh, acumen scholarship, we now understand that there were two kinds of colonialisms. One which is really an anachronistic one, namely, if you describe someone as a colonialist today, you may misdefine, uh, okay, or not define correctly uh, what you're looking at. But if you define certain societies today in the world as settler colonial societies, not as colonial societies, as settler colonial societies, you get much closer to an accurate description of not only the past in Palestine, and not only the present in Palestine, but unfortunately also the future in Palestine. The difference between colonialism and settler colonialism is that settlers who came to North America, to Latin America, to Australia, to New Zealand, to the southern tip of Africa, and to Palestine, were not sent there by their empires. There were people who were running away from something. Some of them were running away from religious persecution. Others uh, were seeking better economic life. Others felt unsafe for, what, for personal reasons. It doesn't matter. But what really combines all of them as an historical phenomenon is the fact that they were looking, if you want, in today's traveler's uh, language, they were buying one-way ticket. They had no intention of going back, and they were not only looking for a home, they were looking for a homeland. And they all encountered the same problem. The homeland that they chose as a safe refuge, usually, was inhabited by someone else. In most cases, they did not hesitate and genocided the natives in order to make the space their own, quite often expropriating the history of these people as their own, uh, sometimes leaving the names of the places. Uh, very few have gone as far as the Americans to call their weapons of mass destruction in the names of the Native American tribes that they have destroyed. Uh, but others went uh, uh, nearly as far as the white settlers of uh, North America. 
uh, where, un unfortunately, the settler colonial project was successful, namely, the indigenous people were annihilated. In many ways, the settler colonial societies today feel quite comfortable to confess about the genocide, to come to terms with that history, because the price is not very high. The price is maybe a different textbook. The price may be a different uh, memorial calendar, maybe a museum that wasn't there before. And this is not undermining what you're doing here. The price, as we know from South Africa, of actually settler colonial projects which did not destroy fully the native people was political solution that a built of redistribution of resources, of sharing rule, the rule, the sovereignty, on finding political and cultural and economic processes which would allow the natives to get back their normal life that were denied to them by the settler colonial project. And if you accept this, you can see another great Israeli success, apart from the fact that the peace process would never deal with Zionism as colonialism. The other side of the coin is dealing with Palestinian resistance to colonialism as terrorism. To this very day, every Palestinian stabbing is regarded as terrorism. Immediately it is, and wrongly, one should say, it's immediately compared to the acts of uh, uh, the Islamic State uh, and Al-Qaeda in Europe. And there's no connection. But, of course, the Israelis would like you to think that this is the same phenomenon of a uh, uh, new kind of uh, political Islam that sends individuals to suicide missions uh, in the name of Islam to hurt the Western civilization. This is not what's happening in Jerusalem or in Haifa. This is not the same. It's a very different context. Unfortunately, some of the Islamic movement themselves are not paying enough attention to the difference between what's happening in Palestine and what's happening uh, in Europe. It's not the same at all. This is part of a long anti-colonialist struggle, a legitimate, moral, anti-colonialist struggle that began from the moment Palestinians, either as individuals or as collective, understood the real nature of the settler colonialist project of Zionism. Of course, you resist by force sometimes, as a last resort, mainly, settler colonialism. Those of you who are familiar with the uh, U uh, Universal Declaration of the Indigenous People, published in 1984, would know that the main body of this declaration of of a, a kind of a united body of people who were victims of settler colonialism around the world, is a demand to recognize the right for an armed struggle as a last resort. And an insistence that the international community would include it in a legitimate self-defense as it does in the United Nations Charter when it relates to the right of nations to defend themselves against an outside aggressor. Of course, unfortunately, the international community did not accept it, neither in the case of the Tamils in, uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, in the case of the FLN in Algeria, the ANC uh, in, in, in South Africa. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a, a very valid point when they talk about themselves as self-defense, people who are... In, uh, are involved in self-defense and not people who are involved in terrorism for the sake of terrorism, which is another great, as I say, Israeli uh, 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 success in framing differently the reality from what uh, uh, it was. So we need to take the two sides of the correct and accurate framing of the reality in Palestine. The settler colonial project of Zionism on the one hand, and the anti-colonial struggle of the Palestinians on the other. That doesn't mean that you cannot criticize 
the means by which you resist colonialism. That doesn't mean that in 2015 you should not seek for nonviolent methodology in order to undermine the project of settler colonialism. But that means that as an international community, you should understand the nature of the struggle and therefore uh, the nature of the peace process. Because the one is the, an outgrowth of the other. I would like to attract your attention more specifically to the idea of partition in this context. And I hope someone is taking care of the time frame because uh, if you don't stop me, we'll have breakfast here together. <laughs> okay.